Welcome to the Smooth Brain Society podcast. Have you ever come across something and thought, I'm not smart enough for this? We think the fault lies with those who present information in ways which are hard to understand. In an attempt to change this, we'll be speaking to researchers, experts, and all-round wrinkly-brained individuals, improving our understanding of a broad range of topics which are rooted in psychology. Join us as we try to develop ourselves one brain fold at a time. Please note that the Smooth Brain Society podcast is distinct from the Herenga Waka Victoria University of Wellington. The views expressed on this show are those of our guests, presenters, and affiliates alone, and we assume no liability for the application of the information discussed. We also take no responsibility for any change in brain folds on part of the audience. Viewer discretion is advised. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the Smooth Brain Society. I am Sahir, and with me today as a co-host is our producer, Fran. I'm, I do not know how to pronounce your last name, so you might need to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Francesca Pekiewicz, um, and I am the salient podcast manager and producer. Fran was really excited to come on today when she heard about our topic. Um, <laughs> today, we will be talking about psychedelics and uh, to introduce uh, this topic to us, um, to introduce drugs to us, we have Professor Bart Ellenbrook. Professor Bart Ellenbrook has been at Victoria University since 2011. He is the principal investigator of the Behavioral Neurogenetics Lab here. His website says that he has 254 publications, um, well, 255 since this morning, because he published another one today. Before that, he was the vice president of neuropharmacology at Evatech, which is a biotech company in Hamburg, Germany. So welcome to the podcast, Professor Bart Ellenbrook. Thank you very much. Also, thank you so here for having me on. I haven't been on the Smooth Brain podcast, so I'm very excited about this and this episode particularly as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll start off, I guess, where we always start off, and that is us getting a little bit of a background of our guests. So if you could, Bart, could you tell us what led you to um, studying and doing what you do? Oh, sure. Um, it's been a long time ago. So I studied, actually, I studied chemistry in the Netherlands a long, long time ago. Nobody can remember that, at least, at least for me. Um, but as I was doing my undergrad, I realized that chemistry is actually incredibly boring. No offense to people who study chemistry, but um, but I had the opportunity to do some postgrad work during my master's in neuroscience. And I had the great opportunity of working together with Lex Coles, who at that time uh, was the principal investigator of the psychopharmacology research group. And he was incredibly enthusiastic and he explained to me how important the brain is and how much fun it is. And that enthusiasm sparked with me. And, and ever since then, um, after my doing my master's, I went away for two years. I spent one year in Saudi Arabia and one year at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. And then I came back to do my PhD with Lex Coles. And after my PhD in 1988, I stayed in the lab until 2006. Actually, in the end, I turned, I became the uh, the boss of my PhD supervisor, which was kind of weird in that he took me again every, seriously in that respect, but formally I was his boss. And then in 2006, as you mentioned, I went to Germany to go to the dark side and spend some time at the pharmaceutical industry. And then in 2011, I came to Wellington and have been here ever since. Oh, uh, can we start off with, you said the term pharmacolo psychopharmacology. Could you just yes. explain what that is? Sure. So psychopharmacology is the, the study of how drugs influence our brain and our behavior. And so you have many different drugs, like drugs that uh, um, we gave for people that have high blood pressure or uh, antibiotics that help us fight infections. Those are not the kind of drugs that we are interested in, but drugs that influence processes in the brain that can help us um, deal with disorders like depression or schizophrenia or 
drug addiction, those are the kind of drugs that I'm particularly interested in and particularly interested in how they affect the brain. Cool. Um, I was just wondering what your experience was like working in the pharmaceutical industry. What did you learn from that? What was that like? What did you you learn that made you go into another direction, that kind of thing? Yeah, it was it was kind of funny. Um, so I wasn't in, in uh, the university in academic academia until two thousand from nineteen eighty eight to two thousand and six, and then as I said, I moved to what some people call the dark side, the pharmaceutical industry. And in the beginning, it was actually quite fun. Um, you see, I mean, ultimately, what you're trying to do in your research is you try to develop something that benefits people, right? I mean, I am particularly interested, obviously, in mental disorders. And if there was, if I could somehow contribute to, to easing the burden, the pain, the mental anguish of people with depression or autism or schizophrenia, then, then I've done something valuable. And so I thought, you know, pharmaceutical industry, they develop drugs. And, and of course, the main interest in the pharmaceutical industry is making money. That's clear. It's an industry like any other. But they do hopefully contribute to, in one way or another, to ease the symptoms of patients with mental disorders. So that's the reason why I wanted to work in the pharmaceutical industry. And it is a very different world from academia. But I, to be honest, I, I got disillusioned after a while, mainly because I noticed that maybe my experience in pharmaceutical industry is different from others. And I mean, I I have friends who have been working in in the pharmaceutical industry for 20, 30 years, and they will probably disagree with me, but the company that I was working in was quite, had a very, can I say, superficial way of doing research. Just to give you one example, we were developing drugs for the treatment of pain, and we had two compounds, chemical compounds, that were almost identical, and we tested them in a a model for pain, and one worked brilliantly, and the other not at all. And so I went to my boss and said, well, that's interesting. Let's try and find out why. Why this one drug that's almost identical to the other doesn't work? And he said, no, I'm not interested in that. I'm only interested in the one that works. I said, yeah, but if you find out why the other one doesn't work, it can help us. No, 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 no. We're not putting any resources, any money in that. And I was thinking, that's such a pity. It's so fascinating to find out why. Let dig it a little deeper, but they're not interested in digging a little deeper. They're just interested in finding something that can help patients. And in the long run, I thought, ah, I miss the academic freedom to say, you know, let's delve into this and try and figure out why this one compound doesn't work when the other one does. And so that's why in the end I, and for personal reasons as well, uh, why in the end I decided to go back to academia again. That's very interesting because, I mean, that kind of, I think, you know, makes sense with why a lot of or sometimes medication can kind of be, some people refer to it as kind of like a Band-Aid solution rather than the full solution because you're not really diving any deeper. Yeah, that's true. That, 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 that's a good point. I mean, we should not forget that probably with the exception of antibiotics, None of the drugs that we have, it goes for diabetes and it goes for kidney disorders and it goes for high blood pressure and uh, um, cardiovascular diseases in general, but also for brain diseases. None of those drugs cure. Mm. They reduce the symptoms and make it possible to deal with the symptoms and with your disorder, but they don't cure. We don't have anything that cures except, as I said, antibiotics that kill the, the bacteria that is infecting you, and that's a real cure. But all the other drugs, they just reduce the symptoms. And and it's important, let, don't, don't get me wrong, that it's really important that we have those drugs and it allows, for instance, if we go to a disorder that I've been investigating for quite a while, schizophrenia, without antipsychotic drugs, the drugs that we use to treat patients with, uh, with psychosis and schizophrenia, most patients would be living in a mental institution because they wouldn't be able to live and cope by themselves. Most of them, many of them can do now. So it's a really, it's been really, really important for patients that we have these drugs, but they're not cured. They have to take the medication for the rest of their lives. 
I yeah I I can also agree with that I um I have premenstrual dysphoric disorder so for that I take mm -hmm. um fluoxetine yep. and my yep. experience has been it definitely does support me and enables me to live you know a more normal you know in quotations life but mm -hmm. also it's not I don't oh sorry my cat has just knocked over something <laughs> I'll just pick that up <laughs> um yeah it um it's not it's not a cure it's not the no, last no. last step for me in my journey with figuring mm -hmm. out how to deal with this yeah. um you said you were interested in schizophrenia mainly in what way is it through like drug treatments or um well there's yeah there is that um there, there's two things i think that that fascinated me about schizophrenia and, and or, or mental disorders in general, as I said, my, my PhD was on, on schizophrenia and I stayed in that area for quite a while. We don't do an awful lot in the area of schizophrenia at the moment, but I, I was particularly or am particularly interested in trying to understand why people develop mental disorders. And we know it runs in the family. Um, and if you have a brother or a sister or a father or a mother that suffers from depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, you have a much higher risk of developing it as well. But we also know that genes don't really cause mental disorders. They increase the risk that you get it, but it's not determined if you have, let's say, the risk genes, whatever they may be, because in most cases we don't really know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will get it. There are non-genetic factors as well. And I'm trying, or we in our research group are particularly interested in trying to understand what those genetic and non-genetic factors are and how they shape the brain in such a way that people may develop, let's say, mental disorders in general. Do you have anything, Fred? I don't have anything to add to that. Do you have a structure that you want this episode to go, Sahir, or is it kind of... It's kind of free-flowing. I was thinking, well, my next question was going to, like, mold more from from the causes into a statement which Bart sent me. Um, but mm. I could not pronounce it for the life of me. Although I practiced for like, what I will only say two minutes because you uh, sent it to me just it's, before it's I got here. That's just a difficult language. Do you remember this quote by heart? No, not by heart. Cool, I have it written down. <laughs> yeah, could, that's good. <laughs> if, you could, if you could pronounce it for me. Sure. All right. So the quote goes, I'll take my glasses off. Het woord toeval bestaat slechts omdat onze hersenen te klein zijn om alle samenhangen te begrijpen. Um, and what does it mean? Oh, that's a good translation. <laughs> so the literal, more or less literal translation is that the word coincidence only exists because our brains are too small to understand all the connections. I actually disagree with that statement. That's why I put it up. Because I don't think our brains are too small. I think we are not smart enough to understand our own brains. And if we were, then we might understand the connections better than, uh, than we do now. And that, is, uh, that leads into the sort of topic of today's meeting and our, our today's podcast when we talk about psychedelics, because one of the things that psychedelics do is to basically, if you want to put it simply, it opens up our brain. It, 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 Timothy Leary, who did a lot of research on psychedelics back in the 60s in the flower power period, he was a psychologist, a professor from, in Harvard. At Harvard, he um, gave this analogy of saying psychedelics is like a magnifying glass. And it basically opens up your mind and it allows you to look both at the world as well as at yourself under a microscope. And it allows you to see, see things that you would normally not be able to see if you didn't have a microscope like that. And I thought that was a very, very nice analogy um, from the many things that I've read, read about psychedelics. I have, I have to admit, I have never taken it myself, although I have been tempted a few times, um, but I think I'm too scared to do it. But uh, but from all the literature that I've read, and it's a lot, <laughs> that is what people say the most, is that they 
realize things about themselves and realize things about the world, connections about the world and how the world exists that they had never realized were possible. I might pull you back a second. Could you introduce us to what psychedelics are? Yes, of course. So psychedelic drugs are drugs that lead to what we typically call a mystical experience. So they alter our consciousness for the duration of that drug effect. And they have been around since thousands of years. Actually, if you go back to uh, some caves in North um, North Africa and in um, France, there have been some cave paintings that are 4,000 years BC, before Christ, um, of psilocybin mushrooms. So, and, and in South America, peyote cactuses that have um, psychoactive or psychedelic substances and other plants have been used in uh, shamanistic rituals and in religious experience for thousands and thousands of years. So they have been around for a long period of time. So how do they actually work? Because yeah. I guess this comes under your chemistry as well as your mm. drug work. Yeah. How do they actually function? The simplest answer is we don't know, but that doesn't help you much. But what we do know is they do influence one specific neurotransmitter in the brain particularly. So neurotransmitters, we you know, we, we have many different cells in our brains, neurons, brain cells, about 85 billion. And each of those 85 billion neurons connect to about 10 to 20,000 other brain cells. And they in turn connect to 10 to 20,000 other brain cells. So it's incredibly complex. And that's probably also why I'm so fascinated by it because it is so complex. And the way these neuro, neuronal cells or these neurons communicate with each other is by chemical messages called neurotransmitters. And many people have heard of neurotransmitters like dopamine that we know is involved in addiction and in reward and happiness and euphoria. And the neurotransmitter that that psychedelics work on is mainly serotonin. And serotonin is often relate, uh, um, discussed in terms of its function in mood. Um, we know that patients with depression have alterations in serotonergic neurotransmission and what these psychedelics seem to do is they stimulate the serotonin communication between cells. Now, that is very simplistically said, and it is way more complicated than that. But that's in a nutshell how we think psychedelics work. Um, what are your thoughts on the trials that um, have been starting to happen in the last, I'm not sure, when, but I would say probably in the last 20 years mm -hmm. um, with psychedelics and mental illness and addiction? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very good question. So I, I, have to be, I always tend to say when I talk to, to, to people about that, don't do this at home kind of uh, um, disclaimer. Um, the studies so far have been very positive especially with psilocybin, um, the in, uh, active ingredient of magic mushrooms. They have shown, studies have shown in patients with depression, treatment-resistant depression, that a single dose or maybe two doses a week or two weeks apart significantly reduced depressive symptomatology up to six months. There have been some studies done with patients with um, terminal cancer not for treating the cancer, but for treating the mental anguish that is associated with it. And I was just going over some data that show that four and a half years later, after a single dose of a psychedelic, the patients still feel significantly less depression and anxiety symptoms than they did before they took the single dose of a psychedelic psilocybin in this case. The studies on uh, drug addiction are less convincing. There is some work done on LSD with alcoholism um, and with nicotine smoking, but it doesn't have a, it didn't show a much of a long-term effect yet. Um, the other area where 
drugs have been very interesting. In psychedelic drugs is, is a big word. It's, uh, we talk about, in this case, about MDMA, ecstasy, which is not technically a psychedelic drug, but it falls sort of in the same kind of category. That has been studied now in several large studies on post-traumatic, post-traumatic stress disorder. And again, the data are encouraging. Why I'm saying don't do this at home is that it's important to keep in mind, if we're talking about psychedelic drugs, that the way you take it, how you take it, in what circumstance you take it, seems to be incredibly important about whether the drug has a strong, has a good effect or not. So the way people look at it is when we talk about drug therapy, this is not drug therapy. It is drug-assisted psychotherapy. So you take the drug in a very quiet, relaxing environment. There is a psychologist there that guides you before, during, and after the psychedelic experience to make sure you have a good experience. And there's plenty of literature that shows now that acute effects of the psychedelics determine the success in the long run. So if you have a very positive, very mystical experience, some people say this is a once in a lifetime experience. I've never experienced anything like this before. The chances are that you want to have a long-term beneficial effect of the drug. If you say, well, this was interesting, but nothing special, then typically the drug will not have a long-term effect either. So it's really important that this is done in a, in a really well-controlled environment. Yeah, I think that's what's great about these studies is they're being, it's creating rhetoric that can hopefully help support the war on drugs in terms of, you know, teaching people how to do this type of thing correctly. And if yeah. it is the therapy with someone who knows what they're doing and how to support someone in that sort of altered state. Yeah, I think that that's an excellent point, Fran. Um, we, we know that we're, we're basically about the same place now as we were in the 60s. We have about 15, 20 years of experience with clinical trials. They had it at that time too. And as much as I admire Timothy Leary, and I don't want to blame him for everything, but his idea of almost you know, now is the time to put psychedelics in the drinking water for everybody. I think that did an awful lot of harm. Yeah. I think it's really important that we keep this scientific. We keep it in the clinic that we explain, you know, this is not, you take psychedelics and you're cured from everything for the rest of your life. That's not how it works. It looks like it has a really, really good place in the treatment of mental disorders, but it is not a panacea that helps everybody with everything. And I think that is really important. And that is the, the, the duty of clinical psychiatrists, but also preclinical neuroscientists like myself to explain, you know, we still, there's still a lot we don't know. And, and it's nice that a drug like this can have a beneficial effect six months after you take a single pill but that also has the risk that it, if it goes, if something goes wrong, you might have a terrible consequence for at least six months in your life. So yeah. we really have to be careful about that. And, and it's not all wonderful and great. So some people get a really panicky attack because one of the things that it seems to, that psychedelics seem to do is what is called ego dissolving or ego death. And, and the idea is that, you know, you have to, break down your ego first before you can build up your new ego. And that helps you with coping with things like depression and anxiety. Um, but that it can be extremely frightening too. And if you have a very frightening experience, then that will negatively impact the long-term benefits again. So it's really important that this is done in a, in a very controlled circumstance and not just, you know, you grab a mushroom here or there and go sit in the corner and eat it up. <laughs> yeah definitely i think also something that's spoken about a lot with psychedelic research and then also just in conversations about it is how important the set and the setting are yes you know, mindset exactly exactly and, 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 
Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And it goes goes back to what Timothy Leary was saying. So he, he came up with this concept concept of set and setting and, and this idea that basically what psychedelics do is providing a um a window into your mind, your state of mind as you are. So if you're in a bad state of mind, then that gets amplified. And that is something that's really or or in a very scary environment that gets amplified. So it's important that um that, that is and, and and that is is not just from a clinical perspective, but from a say research perspective, also extremely interesting. Mm-hmm. How I mean we always we just talked about how psychedelics work. Uh, they 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 stimulate serotonin in the brain. But there's way more to it. I mean, the, the fact that whether you're in a good mood or not determines whether the how the drug works and what the effects of the drugs are three months later. I mean, that is something from a theoretical perspective that I find fascinating and would love to know more about. Are there any theories on that as it stands as to why one dose of something causes such dramatic changes? Later down the line? Uh, no, it, 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 that's really in a, in a very, very early stage. So there, there's now more and more literature coming out, research done, uh, both preclinical with animals and in clinical studies that uh, looking at these communication patterns, we call that functional connectivity in the brain. So the brain is made up not just out, out of 85 billion cells, but also all kinds of different brain regions. You have the frontal cortex, you have the temporal cortex, you have the occipital, blah, 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 many different areas. And they talk with each other continuously. And we can identify individual networks depending on what we do. If you have to pay attention, then the attention network becomes active. If we have to make a, a complicated decision, the executive functioning network becomes active. If we just sit here quietly relaxing, then the default network becomes active. And there's ev- some evidence, but it's really very preliminary, as this came out last year or the year before, um, how these networks change when people take psychedelic drugs. And, and again, a single dose can change the connectivity for at least three months. That study didn't go any further than three months. But why that is and how that is influenced by what state of mind you are in is, is currently completely unknown. Yeah, it's a bit like, oh, well, the term is kind of like resetting your default network, resetting your like, uh, yeah, your yeah. default state of mind, to mm-hmm. say. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That, that's kind of the idea that, and it, it, in that sense, it, it uh, one of the other tools in the toolbox that we have for treating depression, it always sounds horrible, is electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, and it, it, it sounds horrible, but it is actually not that horrible anymore because it, that has been used in, in for, for many, many years. The classical way was, the classical idea was that you reset the brain by putting a lot of electricity in your brain, basically shaking it away. In the past, that was done with people being really fully conscious. And you can imagine that must be horrible um, because you're basically pr- producing a, a convulsion, an epileptic attack. Um, and it's still being used for patients that do not respond to antidepressant treatment. Uh, but nowadays, people are put to sleep. Anesthetic anesthesia, when you do that, so they don't suffer any convulsive activity, but it does seem to work. And in some ways, it's quite similar to psychedelics in a way that it works quite rapidly. And in some patients have quite a long positive effect. And uh, I personally, if I had the choice, I'd rather take the psychedelic, to be honest. Um, but it, it might very well be that in a way it is also as you said, resetting the brain. And, and it does, does remind me of, of a, a conversation I, I, I watched on, on YouTube, actually, about somebody who was um, in one of those clinical trials with psilocybin for depression. And he said, well, he was taking the psilocybin, the second, he had two sessions. And he said, in the second session, I had talked to my um, 
psychotherapist was there and he said, you open up your mind and let it go. And he said, I had very uh, difficult time doing that the first time, but the second time I did that. And he said, and I spoke and I heard my inner critic talking to me. And, he, and I said to my inner critic, why do you always put me down? Why do you always complain about me? I really don't like it. Can you please stop? And he said, and after that, the inner critic was gone and he never came back. And it sounds like almost like you'd really need to reset your brain and get rid of the negative emotions or the negative uh, um, voices in your head um, in order to have a therapeutic effect. And I found that fascinating to see. Yeah, that, that is extremely interesting. I, I just wanted to go back to um, what you were talking about with, um, were you referring to his shock, shock therapy? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That's interesting because I didn't realize that they still did it, but it's interesting that they're uh, doing it. Under I, 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 yes. I'm not sure whether they still do it in New Zealand, to be honest, but I do know that in many other, well, in, 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 yeah, quite a number of other countries, it is still, it, it is a last resort. Let, let's mm. be clear about that. Uh, but people who really, and there are about 20 to 30 percent of people who really do not show any benefit at all from any antidepressant drug, um, they are offered the opportunity. And and some people do, and some people have really, really positive positive uh, effects from it. Yeah. yeah it I might well it's... be that when, if psychedelic drugs become more available as a, um, as an accepted accepted. Uh, alternative that that might completely take over and uh, and maybe psychedelic uh, uh, shock therapy will not be used at all anymore. They could very well be. I think it's great though that if they are doing it under anesthesia and mm. the patient has choice, I think that that is great because I think a big thing with shock therapy is that it was kind of forced and very traumatic, you know. Um, yes. Yeah. 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 Of course. That's why I say you know it sounds horrible, and it was horrible in those days. Nowadays, yeah, obviously, it, it it's only done with the explicit permission uh, by the patient, and and under very controlled circumstances and under anesthesia, so they don't. You know, in the past, it was thought that it was necessary to literally shake the patient awake. Yeah. Um, and or shake the patient out of his depression. Uh, nowadays, we know that that is not necessary. And and again, we don't know really what, what happens when people do that in the brain, just as we don't really know what happens when you take a psychedelic. But it does seem to have, to have an, a positive effect. Yeah. Hmm. Um, as far as what happens in the brain, because we talk about ego breaking down and telling the negative voices away there's no actual known seat of those things in the brain is there no no no, no. Mm -hmm. and therefore my question was are there any like fmri studies or like any brain imaging studies looking at psilocybin and seeing what yeah. it, how it act, works yes so as i said the, the one of the things that we looked uh, or one of the things that has been looked at is how these networks these communication networks change uh when you take a psychedelic drug now that's usually done in healthy volunteers it hasn't been done much in relation to patients with depression yet but that's certainly to come there's a lot of research especially in in the uk there's an awful lot of research on psychedelics and in the us as well i was talking to a colleague of mine who's been working in the field of psychedelics for a long period of time. He's a good friend of mine, and, and he told me recently that there are at least 50 clinical trials ongoing in the U.S., and that's a lot, on just psychedelics, not just on depression, but also PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, generalized anxiety disorders, um, drug addiction, alcoholism, et cetera. Um, so we are trying now to understand what happens. So we, we do that. At a molecular level, as I said, it stimulates the serotonin neurotransmission. We do know there is evidence from rat studies that it increases the uh, number of communication between cells. So cells communicate through what is called a synapse when two cells come together and the message from one part 
the cell is delivered to the next, that's called a synapse. And we know that the number of synapses increase after LSD or psilocybin or uh, mescaline, for example. We also uh, know that these communication networks that we have, as I said, this default network is toned down after psilocybin. And there is some evidence to suggest that after a while it goes back up again. And maybe that has something to do with the ego breaking down and being rebuilt. Uh, but that's, we, we don't really know. We don't know the details of this network in so, so clearly that we can say, you know, there is a decrease in the network connectivity. And the increase that we see later is different from the level of connectivity that we had before. So that's still speculative, but you could imagine that that may play a role because this just this default network, as we call it, is generally regarded as owing our personality. So how we are when we are not stressed, we are not uh, uh, engaged in any activities, just when we sit and relax, that that network is most active. Um, I was interested in because I actually haven't heard about the trials um, done with schizophrenia. What what kinds of things, if you know, happen slash help patients no, with so, schizophrenia oh. and the types of um, hallucinations and things that you'll have? Yeah. And then, you know, sometimes those drugs can also do that as well. How does mm. that kind of work? Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. I there, there are no trials, as far as I know, there are no trials, trials done with schizophrenia. Um, traditionally, it was thought that psychedelics induce a state like schizophrenia. If you look very carefully, that's actually not the case in the sense that most of the hallucinations in patients with schizophrenia are auditory, so they hear voices whereas most of the hallucinations in, with a psychedelic drug are visual. People see things moving. They uh, see visual distortions, like as if you're looking through a fish eye lens, colors that float around. Um, uh, and, 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 and another fascinating thing that you see with psychedelic drugs is what is called synesthesia, and that is that the senses merge so people can smell colors or, or see sounds and things like that, which is hard to comprehend. But um, so the fact that we have these different senses, like we can hear things, we can see other things, we can uh, feel other things or smell other things. And in those, and they are completely separated from each other. And in those people uh, uh, or in people with, with psychedelic experiences, those Different senses seems to merge, and um, and that's also something that you don't see much in schizophrenia. So the, the classical idea that psychedelics induce a state of schizophrenia is now generally considered not to be correct. But I don't think there are any, as far as I know, there are no clinical trials with um, with schizophrenia or in schizophrenia with psychedelic drugs. Just as something that you might be thinking about is that something that you think could go together in terms of doing a trial or probably not in your opinion um no i i'd be very hesitant to be honest so, mm. so one of the problems with schizophrenia is that in contrast to say people with depression or people with addiction is that people with schizophrenia generally have no strong self-reflection in the sense that they don't realize that the voices they hear in their heads are, are not there mm. or the delusions that they have are delusions. They are convinced that they are right. Mm. And so they are very skeptical about other people in general, quite paranoid because if people say, and I, that's not true, then they will not believe that. So, and I think you need to have a good sense of self-reflection to be able to 
deal with a psychedelic experience. So I'm, I, I would be worried to give it to patients with schizophrenia, to be honest. Yeah, I, I, that's what I had thought as well, because I, I must have misunderstood in thinking you said that um, there were trials with it, because I thought that seemed like an interesting... Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I, do. I, I, I may have misspoken. So, so uh, major depressive disorders, bipolar disorders, possibly... Um, but certainly uh, anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, um, drug addiction, alcoholism, those are the main areas where psychedelics are being tried out now. Mm. I'm also quite curious in um, PTSD and did you say MDMA? Yes. Is yes. it kind of, is the process there to hopefully change how a patient may view a memory i i wouldn't i wouldn't know what what's the process that's that they're hoping to get from those trials yes yeah no that's exactly correct so so uh the idea is that the and and, and again it's, it's, it's a bit like with psychedelics although mdma ecstasy works very differently uh but it also influences serotonin but in a different way that also influences dopamine and one of the problems with mdma is that it can be addictive Whereas psychedelic drugs, there is no hint that it can be addictive and it's also extremely safe. There is no known lethal dose for LSD or psilocybin. So you can't overdose. Um, with MDMA, there is some clinical, so some literature in rats and mice that it can actually damage your brain with prolonged use. So, um, with one or two doses like we typically do in clinical trials, that should not be a big issue. But there is the risk that it might be addictive, so people are a bit more careful there. But the idea is that, yes, indeed, not so much that you forget your memory, but that you learn to live with your memory and that the memory, the traumatic memory, doesn't have that much of an impact. And there are, again, there have been very, very positive studies, especially in the UK. There was a phase three trial, which is sort of the highest level of the trials after the phase three trial if those are successful then you can start applying for um the drug being routine, routinely used by patients and normal doctors can prescribe it as well normal doctors being not mm -hmm. those doing involved in clinical trials at, at, at specialized institutions and that was a very positive study as well um, so people really had significantly less PTSD like symptoms like sleeplessness, uh, high blood pressure, heart rate uh, um, problems, and fearful uh, uh, memories as a result of the MDMA trials. Yeah, that's great. Can you talk to us a little bit now about your research in, in with drugs or like yeah. so with psychedelic drugs? Yeah, sure. So we we've only just started scratching the surface i think so so we are mainly interested in the question that you asked earlier so how is it possible that when you give a drug six months later there is still a beneficial effect or as i said this one study that was done on on cancer patients four years later there is still an effect after a single drug so that must mean that something fundamentally has changed in the brain and we're trying to investigate what may happen. So what's the molecular mechanism, what happens at the cell level, and what happens at the behavioral level in, um, when you give psychedelics. In, in our case, we work with, um, with rats. So we give it to a rat and we see how the behavior of the rat changes, whether they become less anxious, less uh, depressed, assuming you can measure depression in, in rats or aspects of depression in rats. Um, and then we look at how, as I said, how the brain changes. Are there new connections being formed as a result of that? Do we see those connections being formed and be remaining stable for a long period of time? So that's sort of the, in a nutshell, the kind of research that we're doing. I can continue with that. Wouldn't that be slightly hard considering we spoke about set and setting? <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. It is very hard. It is very hard. Um, and it, 
that's another aspect, and, and and both you and friend brought it up earlier. Set the setting is something that I'm fascinated about too, and I have been thinking, or we've been thinking about ways to look at that and to look at whether the environment in which you give the drug. I mean, the environment. So set basically means your mental state. Uh, you're in a good mood or in a bad mood when you take the drug. And setting is the environment in which you are. Is it a very comforting, quieting, relaxing environment or is it a very stressful environment? Now, the environment we could theoretically change relatively easy. We could either make it a more relaxing environment with lots of toys and, and stuff for the animals to play with versus a more barren environment or maybe environment where it's a bit louder, it's more noise and stuff, it's a bit more stressful for the animals. Well, we could look at that. Now, set is, of course, more complicated because we don't really know what's going on in a rat's mind, so we don't know whether the rat is um, in a positive or a negative mood. Well, not, not, not in great detail anyway, so that's a bit more difficult to investigate, but it would be fascinating to to look at that as well to see whether that actually has a cons has difference in um in how the drug affects the the brain yeah um something i was thinking about with the set for rats mm -hmm. would you, when would you particularly and like what would be the process of giving giving a rat um, a drug for a trial would you would you give it to them with food or you do you inject it or what what's that kind of process there yes yeah so we typically inject it um that is sort of the standard way because that that way you know that um the amount of drug that you want to get goes into the rat if you we could theoretically do it orally and give him a, a pill or uh, sugar coated, literally, or peanut butter coated. Your rats love peanut butter. You could mm. put it, a little peanut butter around it. The problem is that I, I don't know how psilocybin tastes or LSD or, or any of those drugs, but uh, rats are quite sensitive to, to taste. So mm. they might take a bite and say, I don't like it and not eat it. And then you have one rat who, but, who had two bites and one rat who has one bite. And, and then it's hard to compare them because they don't. They didn't get exactly the same amount of drugs, so that's why we typically inject it. Would you, for um, example, just thinking about how to get the rat into a better mindset, mm -hmm. would you inject it and then then give the rat some peanut butter or something like that? Yeah, that could be. That could be. And then uh, there are other ways in which you could do it. You could you could have the rat uh, play with a mate, for instance. They love playing with each other, um, and so they they would be in a good mind set um and then you give the drug versus a rat who doesn't play and is in in, his, in a cage all by himself mm. being a must is it rats are very sociable animals so they would be less uh sociable and so they'll be less less uh they'll be more stressed if they are uh by themselves so they would certainly be in a less positive mindset than when they are together have you done trials um with two rats together either one on the drug and one not or both of them or no we have not we have not we, we do a lot of work on social behavior in rats as well but not in in relation to psychedelics but we do know that psychedelics have a quite dramatic effect on the behavior of rats um so if we treat one rat with psychedelics it would be interesting to see how other rats respond to that um, so, yeah, that would certainly be an interesting way to look yeah. at it. I was just thinking about it in terms of, you know, it goes into that that setting um, mm -hmm. dynamic yeah. in, in the way that other, well, I guess we're, we're talking about rats, so other beings, for example, could affect your environment. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, so, so many interesting things to do. <laughs> the, there's an anecdote from one of your former students that after – he had injected one of the, after the trials were done and the rats were put back in the cage with their cage mates, the cage mates would look at them or behave slightly different with them post the injection as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So. Mm. That's right. I, and I, I wouldn't, be, I, that, that doesn't surprise me. And because uh, indeed uh, their behavior is quite clearly different. And uh, I'm sure the other rats will pick that up as well. 
um, whether that put those other rats in a positive or a negative mindset is is something that I that, that we don't know, obviously. But so, what are the most recent upcoming directions in your lab? Because you said you're in the infancy of your work. Um, yeah, so so we are, we're currently setting up an experiment where we're focusing on um, depression-like symptoms in rats. Now, that's that's difficult to measure, uh, of course. Is we don't know whether rats are depressed. But what we do is we look at what we call anticipatory pleasure. And it basically means um, that you feel excited or happy about something that is coming up. So if I say to friend, let's go and have uh, dinner at Logan Brown tomorrow. This is a purely hypothetical example. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sorry. Then friend would be hopefully assuming that she likes the food there. I've never been there, but it's supposed to be really good. Um, she would be very happy. And in anticipation of us going there, and, and I'll paint, so of course, it makes it <laughs> um, That would be anticipatory pleasure. And then we go there and we have dinner. And assuming it is really good, we're very happy about eating it as well. And that is what we would call consummatory, in this case, literally consummatory pleasure. Now, those are the kind of things you can actually measure in rats as well. And we do know that patients with depression suffer predominantly from a lack of anticipatory pleasure. So they don't get excited about nice things that happen. When they do happen, they feel some sort of excitement and some kind of happiness, albeit sometimes muted. But um, it is especially this anticipation of something nice that is happening that is completely lacking in patients with depression. So, um, And we can mimic, mimic that in rats. So the way we do that is... We put rats in a box, and after, let's say, five minutes, they get Fruit Loops, and rats love Fruit Loops. And we do that every day. And so after a while, the animals know that when they get into the box, in a couple of minutes' time, I'm getting something that is really nice. And they start to become really active, and they start to vocalize, so they talk with each other at a specific frequency that we normally can't hear because it's above our, uh, um, our range. And they make a lot of those calls in anticipation of something that is going to happen. And um, and if you make a rat uh, a bit depressed, then they make significantly less of those calls. And we have a rat with a genetic alteration that in humans, that genetic alteration increases the risk of people developing depression those rats also show much less of those anticipatory um, behaviors prior to getting the food. So our hypothesis, our idea is that if you didn't treat them with psychedelics, the anticipatory pleasure would go up. Mm-hmm. That's one of the first experiments that we're planning in the lab at the moment. It's actually, I think we've just started last week. Uh, Larissa, one of my PhD students, is doing those experiments at the moment. Exciting. We're reaching an hour mark. Were there any other questions you had for him? Um, Not that I can think of. I think you've covered some really great topics and answered everything that I could think of. So, Thank yeah. you. I can leave it to you considering you do introductory psych lectures as well and popular <laughs> psych lectures. Are there any things which you would like to cover which we actually did? And we can... Um, no, I think we've covered everything. We've gone yeah. through... A- wide range there. yeah we got into a wide range of things i mean we talk on for a couple of more hours but uh, that's probably not a good idea <laughs> yeah we get really into research and things as well yeah yeah, yeah 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 um but thanks for that the last thing which we do is because we want to like end each episode the same way we do mm-hmm. a set of rapid fire questions yeah which i mentioned to you um Friend hasn't been a part of this, so she can like kind of react to Bart's answers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, sure. so yeah. Fire away. All right. Summer or winter? Summer. Movies or TV shows? TV shows. All right. If your life was a TV series, what genre would it be? Nordic Noir. <laughs> I'm very crazy about Nordic Noir at the moment. <laughs> Outdoors or indoors? Outdoors. How does it go with working in a lab? Yeah, well, that's how it works. Um, I, I've played soccer my entire life. Well, not anymore, but I like outdoors. And I love birds. So. 
Right. You said birds, but cats or dogs? Oh, dogs, no doubt. We have two. What's your weapon of choice? <laughs> A lightsaber. <laughs> Which superpower would you like to have? Flying. That's what my son always asked me too. I have a nine-year-old that's almost 10. Mm. He always asked me, if you have, what, which superpower would you like to have? I always say that I'd have to pick three, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that's unfair. <laughs> that's, that's, who is that's cheating, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Mark Olson, who was on earlier, said that yeah. the most common answer given by teenage boys is invisibility. Yeah, yeah. that's what Robin always wants to I like to fly. Fly is very more fun than invisibility. Mm. Uh, Tia Nehas was find a, be able to find a parking lot. <laughs> I'll be able to find a parking space. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that fits with, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. What is your least favorite type of music? My least favorite type of music? <laughs> There's a genre in German music. It's very popular. I always call them Old people's music. I don't know. There's a there's probably a word for it, but I don't know what. But it's terrible. <laughs> I don't know what the genre is called, to be honest. <laughs> I know you garden quite a bit. So so mm-hmm. what is the ugliest fruit or vegetable? The ugliest fruit or vegetable? Uh grapefruit. I like oh it's not ugly, but I don't like it. it tastes horrible. I don't like it. Right. <laughs> okay. So then what is your favorite food or cuisine? My favorite cuisine or food, uh, Korean. Any particular reason? Uh, June knows how to cook very well. <laughs> June's my wife. Uh, <laughs> I love Korean. Korea. Ori- uh, from Korea originally. We just had friends over on, on the weekend. Tia was actually over on Saturday and we had Korean. It was tasted great. <laughs> All right. If you could be any animal, what would it be? Uh, a ferret. <laughs> I love ferrets. We used to have ferrets as, as pets, but we, we, when we came to New Zealand, we weren't allowed to take them with us. Ah, oh, they're the cutest animals. So much fun. <laughs> <laughs> what is the worst thing you've paid money for? Whoa. Well, lots of things I've paid money for that I can regret. Jeez. Oh, in general, I don't like to pay money for clothes. Yeah, it's a waste of time, but... <laughs> your girlfriend will explain why it's important that you have clothes but I like to wear the same t-shirt for 10 years if I have a choice <laughs> is there anything ridiculous someone has tricked you into thinking or believing no I don't think so <laughs> <laughs> what quote or saying do people say which you think is complete bullshit what doesn't kill you make you stronger I think with what doesn't kill you can can be horrible. <laughs> and I mean, if you think of PTSD, but I think it's a stupid saying. Mm. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? New Zealand. Fran, you, you may or may not know this, but I think this is the 10th episode we're recording and nine people have said New Zealand so far. It's really? The, <laughs> it's the best place in the world. Yeah. Do you have a lot of... Quite a number of different... Well, maybe not today, but... No, and I was I was I was talking to my my sister in law a few years ago, just before COVID, when I was in the Netherlands, and she said, "When are you coming back?" And I said, "I'm not coming back." And she said, "What do you mean you're not coming back? Why should I come back?" I said, "Yeah, but all your family is here and stuff." I said, "Yeah, well, I miss them, but New Zealand is great." And yeah, how about when you retire? I said, Even then, I don't see any reason to come back. It's a beautiful country. Most people are in New Zealand are extremely nice and friendly. Uh, the nature is spectacular. Lifestyle is great. I'm really happy. So there's no reason to go. Is it okay if we send these clips to Tourism New Zealand to sponsor us, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. A couple more questions. Sure. If you were not doing this, what would you be doing as in your field of work? Instead of doing your neuroscience, you I guess so, yeah. Um, I would make 3D animations. I would be a 3D artist. Well, not a successful one. <laughs> I would try. That's what I do in my spare time. <laughs> All right. Our final question is, if you could leave us with one piece of advice, uh, what would it be? Have fun. 
That's what I'm doing my whole life. Well, as much as I can. And uh, I, I, this is my work and I get paid for it. And I've, I've said it a few times to other people as well, but it's, it's incredibly, pri- you're incredibly privileged that you can go to work every day having fun. And at the end of the day, or at least every two weeks, you get money in, the, in, in your bank account for doing things that you like. Yeah, no, Dr. Hassan, when she came on, said basically the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, just... <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're privileged and you're lucky that, that, I mean, I know a lot of other people. I mean, if I had to work at, at Pack and Save with all due respect or, or at, at ANZ Bank or whatever, uh, I, I am certainly wouldn't be so saying the same thing. But this is, it's just try and find something that you really are passionate about. And if you can do that for the rest of your life, then you're a lucky person. That's awesome. Thank you so much. You're for more than welcome. Us. Oh, yeah. If people wanted to contact you, um, how could they get in touch with you? Bart.ellenbrook at vuw.ac.nz. I'll check that in like the yep. description. My well. email address, the best way to contact me. Easy. And thanks again, friend, for thank you, friend. joining us. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Bart, for um, speaking on this topic. I'm extremely interested. So thank you so much. My pleasure. And thanks, everyone, for listening. You can find us until next time on our social media at the Smooth Brain Society um, and on at Saliantgram as well on Instagram. And thanks everyone. Until next time, keep having fun. Yep. Do All what right. you enjoy. Bye. Bye. Thanks.